Press the bell icon on the YouTube app and never miss another update from Sebastian Fitness Solutions. This video is going to be the first of a new video series that I'm doing at my YouTube channel and it's going to feature the different muscle groups of the human body, discussing its anatomy, kinesiology, biomechanics and then through the understanding of these sciences determine the most optimum and efficient way to train those muscle groups for maximum size and strength. Now the reason I'm doing this video series entirely is because I've seen people make a lot of faulty exercise choices in their routines and they do so because they select their exercises either based on some uh, stranger's recommendation online without any backup or understanding of exercise science or more, freak, more often than, than not they choose exercises based on what they feel works better for them you know if one exercise feels better they, they tend to do that more than the other now the problem with this is that both of these are highly unreliable the first being that you're leaving the research up to some stranger which you don't even know whether if he doesn't give an explanation as to why this exercise works based on exercise science logic then you're it's probably a fault the guy is never to be trusted anyway and more commonly if you're doing it based on how it feels it's highly unreliable because as we know we can't determine the efficiency of an exercise based on how it feels so I hope through this video and through the understanding of all the uh, of anatomy and kinesiology and all the things that go into the exercise science you will be able to understand and make educated decisions on which exercises to keep in your routine and which to dump. This video, the first video is going to feature a body part or a muscle group which is probably one of the most famous, most popularly uh, trained muscle groups in the community of muscle building enthusiasts and gym rats. It's one that gets trained more than any other muscle part on a Monday. So I'm sure that you guys have guessed by now, yes we're talking about the chest. A lot of misinformation, a lot of wrong poor exercise choices made when it comes to training chest too much some, sometimes too much is done sometimes inefficient exercises have been chosen over efficient ones so i really like to start off with this topic uh, as the first episode anyway without any further ado let's get into chest training 101 so starting off with chest training now if you're looking for training the chest muscle or rather the pectoralis muscle group in the most optimum fashion for building muscle you need to first understand the muscle itself which will then help you understand what the muscle does and as a result you'll be able to figure out what exercises work best for it. So the pec major, the pectoralis muscle group involves two kinds of, two types of muscles namely uh, the pectoralis major and the pectoralis minor. We are all familiar with that. The pec minor, starting off with that, is a small muscle group that is that lies beneath the pec major and it basically, its, its origin point is between the third and fifth rib and its insertion is all the way into the scapula. Now the function of the pec minor is to is purely to stabilize the scapula. Meaning any exercise that involves a stabilization of scapula, any pressing exercise like for the chest or even for triceps like close grip bench presses, like parallel bar dips, all of these involve uh, stabilization of the scapula and as a result involve you involve a lot of activation of the pec minor. So there is no need to explicitly train the pec minor. Now many people think, you know, make the mistake of trying to say, oh, I'm going to explicitly train um, the pec minor. Now I don't know how they do that because I don't see a way they can specifically isolate that uh, or any need, for, as a matter of fact, for training it separately because it's involved heavily in all exercises, all pressing exercises for the chest and triceps. So let's leave that out of the discussion. The main focus of this discussion is going to be the pectoralis major, which is the big chunk of muscle that we see, the one that we are interested in hypertrophying. I, in for in uh, getting bigger. I don't know if I said that right. <laughs> so anyway, the pec major muscle. This is the big chunk of muscle that you see here. Now, if you look at the muscle itself, many people, uh, yeah, many people talk about training the upper, mid, and lower chest. They always describe it in those three senses, three ways. But in order to classify a muscle into an upper region or lower region or whatever, the muscle fibers need to have different origin points or insertion points or both in order for it to be classified into two parts of it, you know. You cannot classify it based on, on seeing it, it has to be on the way the muscle is or originates or inserts. Now if you look at the pec muscle itself, the pec major muscle, the, you can see this portion of the fibers, they originate, or rather I think I'll show you a different image for this. 
Yep, this is better. If you look at these, the fibers over here, I'm not sure if you can see that yet. Sorry about that. Yep, this should be visible. The fibers up here, if you notice, they originate at the anterior portion, the front portion of the scapula, uh, of the clavicle, sorry, and they insert into the humerus. The other fibers that are running downward, these ones originate at the anterior surface, the front surface of the sternum, as well as the second to sixth costal region. And they insert into the humerus, just as, just as the previous, version, previous fibers. So this is how you get the classification of upper chest and lower chest because there's a certain portion of fibers that in originate at, at a different point that is at the clavicle and a certain portion that originate at the sternum and the costal region. That is why they are called the clavicular fibers, the upper pec region and the sternocostal fibers which is the lower pec region. There is no middle chest. So people would say there's middle chest and there's a separate way of working it. They are incorrect on that. There is an upper chest, there is a lower chest and this consideration is very important in understand because further on when you understand what exercises you'll use to train them, we'll, we'll get back to this. Now, what are the functions that, that the pec major performs? The first thing is pressing. Now that's not a function of the chest itself, it's a movement. It's a movement that involves a synergistic working of the chest muscle as well as the anterior deltoid and your triceps. But for simplicity's sake, let's keep it at that. Let's talk about uh, pressing rather than the specific function of the chest. Um, which in this case would be horizontal adduction, which is bringing the arms together horizontally. This function is what we mimic when we do exercises like flies. So now you know the reason why we do it, because it trains a specific function of the, that, that the chest is purely involved in, that is the uh, short horizontal addu adduction. Now that we know the functions that the chest performs, we can understand what exercises will train the most, the best. Now, before we start, what is the the patented exercise that people use for training chest the flat bench press it's the most one of the most famous exercises out there it's probably the favorite of many guys out there because they just every Monday they religiously go into the gym to and you know everyone asks how much you bench how much you bench that's a very famous question so that's a, a very popular exercise that people do for chest but what if I told you that it is not the most optimum exercise for chest I'm gonna back it up in a bit in order to train a muscle in the most optimum fashion, in order for the weight that you're lifting to cause maximum tension in a set of muscle fibers, in order for it to be, for maximum muscle fibers to be recruited, the resistance that you place on the muscle must be in line with the muscle fibers that you're training. So the more in line the movement is with your muscle fibers, the more that resistance and lifting creates tension in the muscle. Now observe the pec major muscle. The upper portion, which we call the clavicular fibers of the pec major, what angle are they at? Slightly, they are moving upward, right? Approximately an angle of 15 to 30 degrees, positive. Then look at the major chunk of the of the of the pec major, which is the sternocostal fibers. What angle do they run at? Most of it runs downward, and there's a certain very limited amount that runs flat. Now think about what I said. If you're doing the flat bench press. That resistance is in line with how much portion of your entire pec major? Barely 5% because only 5% of your muscle fibers are in, com are in complete horizontal line. Most of it is either at a positive angle of 15 to 30 degrees, clavicular fibers or sorry, most of it is in the minus 15 degrees which is the sternocostal fibers running downward and a certain amount is going upward which is 15 to 30 degrees which is the clavicular fibers. Very limited amount rise flat. So an exercise that has to stimulate the sternocostal fibers has to be at an angle of minus 15 degrees, preferably, in order to recruit maximum muscle fibers, in order to get maximum tension of that resistance. And which exercise would that be? The decline bench press. That is why the decline bench press is the best exercise in order to train the sternocostal fibers of the chest. That's not the only reason. The decline press also allows greater range of motion it also limits the involvement of the anterior deltoid and allows the tricep, which is the main assisting muscle in the chest, in chest movements, to perform or to uh, assist better. Now, the anterior deltoid is the weakest link in this exercise. Whether it's any kind of pressing that you're doing for chest, whether it's inclined, flat, or declined, the anterior deltoid is the limiting um, muscle. It's the weaker muscle of all of them. So, if you reduce the involvement of that, 
you get more involvement of your chest. Your chest and triceps can lift heavier weight. It's you're also safer, um, you know, in terms of injuries. Uh, you're safe in terms of injuries compared to the flat bench press. So all in all, it's the perfect package. So if you're looking to get maximum size in your sternocostal region of your chest, look to swap your flat bench press for the decline bench press. And if you're looking for training your and the second portion of your training has to obviously involve training the clavicular head, which would be at an angle of 15 to 30 degrees, which is the incline bench press. So this is what your ideal pressing routine for chest should be. Decline bench press and incline bench press. That's it. You do not need flat bench press. I can attest to that. Because you're training all the muscle fibers you need. If you're, if you're involving your sternocostal uh, head, sternocostal fibers through your decline press, you do not need a flat bench press added on to your routine. It's unnecessary. Now if you're somebody who is looking, if you're a powerlifter or who is looking to get stronger in their bench press specifically for a sport or anything, powerlifting, then it would make no sense for you to get yourself used to these exercises, but rather you would focus on bench press, flat bench pressing, because your nervous system has to adapt to that. But if you're looking for muscle gain and that's it, decline press, incline press, that's it in terms of pressing. And finally, you will include a certain one or the other form of fly. The point I want to make in this is that many people will do something like an incline dumbbell fly, which is an inferior exercise. The reason for that is that it's, a, it's an exercise that involves you to move in a circular pattern. Now think about line of resistance. The weight that you're lifting a dumbbell can exert force in only one direction, perpendicularly downward. If, you're, if your movement path is circular, the, the resistance, that entire dumbbell resistance, however how much of a weight it is, say it's a 20 pound dumbbell, the 20 pound dumbbell will, will provide maximum its entire resistance that is 20 pounds only for a very small portion of your rep at the, at the two extremities that's it it is not going to have complete tension throughout the movement because the weight that you're exerting the that you're pulling is moving straight downward it's not in line with your fibers it's not going to provide continuous tension so any kind of circular movement be it a fly be it a bicep curl be it a um, side lateral raise any of these exercises it's always better to do them in cables simply because the cables will allow you to get continuous tension throughout the range of motion rather than in bits and pieces which is what dumbbells or free weights will provide in a circular movement so keep that in mind not just for chest but also for other exercises just as a pointer so there you have it my friends my description or my breakdown of how to go about chest training it's very simple you don't need too many exercises you just need a decline press an incline press and flies that's it so I hope that this video gives you an insight on how to train your chest in the most optimum fashion and if any of you guys out there who have any questions or anything that you want to cross check with me, please post them below in the comment section. And finally, stay tuned for more episodes of this series where I'm going to describe different muscle groups and how to go about training them in the most optimum fashion. So as usual guys, if you like this video, give it a thumbs up. If you want to stay get updates for my new videos, please subscribe to, the, to my channel and uh, help support Sebastian Fitness Solutions. So, enough talking. See you guys next time. Talk soon. Goodbye. Hey, thank you for watching that video. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. And finally, to watch another video, click right over here.